Hi everyone, welcome to this teaching session on hip x-ray interpretation where the main focus is going to be on diagnosing neck or femur fractures. My name's Harry and I'm a junior doctor working in the southwest of England. In this session we're going to learn a structured approach to interpreting hip x-rays using the easy to remember mnemonic ABCs. We're also going to revise Petal's anatomy which is essential to know when interpreting hip x-rays. We'll practice identifying hip fractures and also learn how to categorize them based on the location of the fracture and how displaced they are. And there'll be a few examples to demonstrate this. This session will be useful for both people who don't know how to interpret hip x-rays and also those who do, but just want to brush up on their skills. If you do find this video useful, please also consider checking out my other videos on YouTube at Medicine Made Simple. So let's get started with the first half of the session, where we're going to look at hip x-ray basics and how to interpret them. The mnemonic we can use to interpret hip x-rays in a systematic way is ABCs. This stands for adequacy and alignment, where you're looking at the quality of the x-ray image and checking it's not wonky. Bones, where you're systematically going through each bone, checking the outer cortex, and the bony texture in the middle, looking for things like fractures and bone malignancy. Cartilage is where we're going to look at all the cartilaginous joints in the hip x-ray. When looking at these, we're mostly looking for any signs of arthritis or dislocations. We'll move on to how to identify these shortly. And soft tissue and other. This is a reminder to check the surrounding soft tissue for any swelling or edema. There's also a few other things to look out for here, which we'll come on to shortly. Following a systematic approach like this is important when assessing any medical image. It means you're less likely to miss out anything that's important. And it also gives you a structure to follow when reporting these. For example, if your consultant asks you to verbally feed back what you can see on an x-ray. But before you start with this structure, you should always check patient demographics, image time and date, and image projection. For patient demographics, check the name, date of birth, and hospital number. You don't want to end up interpreting the wrong patient. Image time and date is also important. Patients might have multiple hip x-rays, and may even have multiple hip x-rays from the same day. So it's important to make sure you're looking at the right one. Image projection refers to the orientation of the patient in relation to the x-ray source. Hip x-rays are usually in anterior posterior projection, or AP. This means that the anterior part of the patient, or their front, is facing the x-ray source, and then their posterior, or back, is facing away from it. When looking for fractures, it's also important to look at a lateral view, where the x-ray is taken from the side. This session will focus on AP hip x-rays, since these are the ones you're more likely to see in exams and clinical practice. So let's go through the structure one step at a time. First is adequacy and alignment, which is a quick assessment of the image quality. An adequate image means we can see the entire pelvis from the top of the iliac crests down to the femoral shafts. An aligned image will have the coccyx and the pubic symphysis both in the midline. Next is bones. For this, we need to know the bony anatomy, as highlighted here. We should be able to visualize the lower lumbar vertebrae so here we've got L4 and L5. Then below this, the sacrum should be visible. And just below the sacrum is the coccyx. Obviously the pelvis also should be visible. And this can be split up into three anatomical parts. You've got the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. These all join together at the acetabulum. The acetabulum will communicate with the femoral head forming the acetabular joint. When assessing bones, you need to be looking at all of these pieces of bony anatomy, comparing left to right, looking for any asymmetries. We need to assess the outer cortex of the bone and the bony texture in the middle. Common pathologies that you can pick up on when assessing bones are things like fractures and bone malignancy. There are three sets of lines that we also need to assess when looking at bones. Firstly is the pelvic brim, which should be mostly circular and symmetrical on both sides. 
Then there are the two obturator foramina. Again, these should have a smooth outline and be symmetrical. Any asymmetry here may represent a fracture, for example, in the superior pubic rami or the inferior pubic rami. The final line to assess is Shenton's line. This is found bilaterally, following the medial edge of the femoral neck and the inferior edge of the superior pubic rami. So any asymmetry in the structure of these bones, discontinuations in their cortex, or disruption to these lines could be a result of a fracture. Whilst assessing bony texture, we need to be looking for lytic lesions, which is where the bone is being broken down, or sclerosis, which is areas of hardening of the bone. These are both signs for bone malignancy, which could be from an osteosarcoma, which is a primary bone cancer, or more commonly from bone metastases. Common cancers that will metastasize to the bone are prostate, kidney, lung, and breast. This hip x-ray belongs to a patient who has breast cancer. There's evidence of bone metastases here, and I'll give you a few moments to see if you can spot where it is. Remember, for bone malignancy, we're looking for any areas of change in the texture of the bone, comparing the right side to the left side for any asymmetries. The site of bone metastases here is in the right femoral head. You can see here how the texture is different compared to the left, which is likely a result of a lytic process where the bone is being broken down. Fractures of the femur are a common finding in hip x-rays. This hip x-ray is normal, so that's probably why you can't see one. But we'll look at fractures in more detail in the second half of this session. Next in our ABC's mnemonic is cartilage. There are three cartilage containing joints that we need to assess here. There's the acetabular joints, which is present on both sides. The sacroiliac joints, where the sacrum attaches to the ilium which is also present on both sides. Then there's the single pubic symphysis, which is the joining between the two pubis bones. Whilst inspecting these, we're looking for any signs of arthritis or dislocation. Here, we're looking at the pathology in the left acetabular joint. This patient has severe osteoarthritis in the left hip. There are four osteoarthritis signs that can be remembered using the mnemonic CONS. This stands for cysts, which are fluid-filled sacs sometimes found in the femoral head. Osteophytes, which are small bony growths. You can see them here. Narrowing of the joint space, which should be around 3 to 5 millimeters in a healthy adult hip joint. Here you can see how it's nearly touching at parts and subchondral sclerosis, which is where the bone underneath the cartilage increases in density. And you can see that here, where the bone appears white. This means it's a higher density than the surrounding area. So as well as looking for arthritis when assessing cartilage, we're also looking for signs of dislocation. Again, looking at those three different joints. One of them has signs of dislocation in this image. This gentleman, has a posterior dislocation of the right acetabular joint. The femoral head can be dislocated posteriorly or anteriorly. Posterior dislocation is the most common. You can also see that there's a fracture in the acetabulum here, which is giving the femoral head more space to dislocate through. Patients with a dislocation like this in their hip will often have a shortened and internally rotated leg. You may also see hip dislocations associated with hip replacements. It's a common complication that can happen post-op and may be due to poorly fitting femoral head and acetabulum, or due to damage or stretching of the surrounding ligaments and soft tissue, which usually hold the hip joints in place. To finish off our assessments, we assess soft tissue and other. Here, we're looking for any effusions in the soft tissue, for example, with inflammatory joint diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. We might also see signs of a periosteal reaction, which could be a result of a healing fracture or cancer. Calcifications, for example, phleboliths or arterial calcifications, and then foreign bodies, like you can see here, in the form of bilateral total hip replacements.
you can see here this is a total hip replacement because both the femoral head and the acetabular have been replaced. For the remainder of the session, we're going to focus on femur fractures, where you'll learn how to identify and categorise them, which is an important skill to have nailed down as a medical student or junior doctor. We classify femoral fractures based on the location of the fracture. Broadly speaking, hip fractures can either be intracapsular, like the top three here. This first one is a capital fracture, going through the femoral head. The next one is subcapsule, where the fracture is at the base of the head. Then you've got transcervical, where the fracture line goes through the femoral neck. Then you've got your extracapsular fractures, like these two on the bottom. Intertrochanteric is one type of extracapsular fracture, where the fracture line goes from the greater trochanter through to the lesser trochanter. And a subtrochanteric fracture is where the fracture line is below the intertrochanteric line. Differentiating between intracapsular and extracapsular fractures is important because it changes the patient's prognosis and the appropriate management. Generally speaking, intracapsular fractures will disrupt the blood supply from the lateral circumflex artery to the femoral head. Because of this, intracapsular fractures often result in avascular necrosis, where the femoral head is unlikely to heal. Because of this, the patients will usually require a hip replacement, where the femoral head will be replaced with a synthetic material. Extracapsular fractures don't usually cause avascular necrosis, as the blood supply from the lateral circumflex artery usually remains intact. Because of this, it's likely that the bone will heal and the two pieces of bone will be able to be reunited. So the hip isn't replaced, but it does need to be fixed back in the right place. For example, using a dynamic hip screw. The joint capsule itself runs between the intertrochanteric line around the hip joint and it's made of multiple ligaments that hold the joint in place. So anything at that intertrochanteric line or below is an extracapsular fracture. We can also classify hip fractures based on how severe the fracture is. For this, we use the garden classification. Stage one is an incomplete fracture. Stage two is complete, so it runs the whole length of the bone, but the fracture is undisplaced. Stage 3 is also a complete fracture, with some displacements, but where some connection between the two pieces of bone remain. Then stage 4, which is the most severe, is where there is complete displacement, so neither pieces of bone have any areas of continuity. This patient has a hip fracture, and I'll give you a few moments to work out where it is and whether it's intra or extra capsular. So this patient has a left-sided subcapital fracture. As we saw previously, this is a type of intracapsular fracture and it's garden type 4 because it's completely displaced. Notice here the asymmetry between left and right. And also notice how there's disruption to Shenton's line. The Shenton's line on the right is nice and smooth. On the left, not so much. Because it's an intracapsular fracture, the blood supply to the femoral head is likely disrupted, so this patient's going to need a hip replacement. Displaced neck of femur fractures, like this one, will usually cause the leg to appear shortened and externally rotated. So remember, displaced fractures and dislocations will both cause a shortened leg, with a dislocation causing it to be internally rotated and a displaced fracture to cause it to go externally rotated. Neck of femur fractures are typically associated with elderly patients who have osteoporotic bones and can often be a result of a low impact fall. This x-ray also shows a hip fracture. I'll give you a few moments to decide whether it's intra or extra capsular.
Here you can see the fracture line running from the greater trochanter down to the lesser trochanter. So this is intratrochanteric. Remember, that's at the edge of the joint capsule and is considered an extracapsular fracture. There's also a fracture and displacement of the lesser trochanter. Because this is an extracapsular fracture, it's unlikely that the blood supply is disrupted to the femoral head. So we don't need to replace it, but it does need fixing in place, which may be done with a dynamic hip screw. So let's do a quick recap of everything that we've covered in this session so that you can leave with everything fresh in your mind. We started by learning how to interpret the hip x-ray using a structured and easy to remember approach using the mnemonic ABCs. But remember, before we do any of this, we check the patient demographics, the image time and date, and the projection of the image. Most hip x-rays are taken in AP, or anterior posterior projection, like this one here. This means that the patient is facing the source of the x-ray. Then we move on to our interpretation. Adequacy and alignment is a quick assessment of the image quality. Here, you want all of the hips visible from the top of the iliac crest down to the femoral shafts. And you want to make sure nothing's cut off from the outside. Alignment means that the coccyx and the pubic symphysis are lined up nice and vertically and are pretty much in the midline of the image. Then we move on to bones, where we're looking for any abnormalities that could be a result of fracture or other bone pathology like bone malignancy. You're systematically going through each part of the bony anatomy, comparing left to right, looking at the outer cortex and the texture in the middle. And you're also going to check the three sets of lines, which are the pelvic brim, the two obturator foramina, and Shenton's line. Then we move on to cartilage, where we're going to assess the three different cartilaginous joints in the hip x-ray. So we're going to look at the acetabular joints on each side, we're going to look at the sacroiliac joints on each side, and we're going to look at the pubic synthesis. The main types of pathology that you'll pick up on here are arthritis, for example, osteoarthritis in the hip joints, and dislocations. And remember the mnemonic that we covered for remembering osteoarthritis, which is CONS for cysts, osteophytes, narrowed joint space, and subchondral sclerosis. Then we finish off our interpretation with soft tissue and other. Here, we're looking for things like soft tissue swelling, calcifications, and any foreign bodies. We also revised the bony anatomy that you can see in the hip x-ray. So we covered the pelvis itself, which is made up of three different bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. We also looked at the sacrum and coccyx and the lower lumbar vertebrae that you can see. Then we also can see the proximal femurs. We also looked at a few neck femur fractures and learned how to categorize them based on the location of the fracture or how displaced they are. When looking at the location of the fracture, you can categorize them into either intracapsular or extracapsular fractures depending whether the fracture line is inside or outside of the joint capsule. Remember that this changes the patient's prognosis and the appropriate management, with intracapsular fractures often resulting in avascular necrosis of the hip and therefore needing a hip replacement. And classifying neck of femur fractures based on how displaced they are is called the garden classification. It runs through stages one to four, four being the most severe here are the references for all of the images I've included in the session. A lot of them are taken from Radiopedia, which is a great resource with loads of cases. So if you want to practice looking at hip x-rays, I'd recommend having a look. Also, if you found this video useful, feel free to check out some of my other videos on YouTube at Medicine Made Simple. Thank you all for watching and thank you to Radcast as well for hosting this teaching session. Please feel free to ask any questions below and I'll do my best to get back to you.